Well, I'm interested to know some of the lessons, and maybe this is an opportunity to dive into your book as well. I can see it there behind you. Um, love the artwork for that. Um, but, you know, to dive into the book and, and some of the lessons that you've learned about designing regenerative cultures and, and what, kind of, um, what kind of things we can watch out for and apply early on, what lessons we can learn from you, that would be awesome. It, one of the central things in my book is is that I, I I kind of try to do a little bit of Aikido with the here's somebody who's trying to summarize 20 years of whole systems design on healthy human systems and a healthy biosphere. Because when, when I sat down to write the book, I, I had this moment of, of a real, not writer's block, but a kind of like a mentor of mine 20 years ago, when I first mentioned that I wanted to write a book, um, said, said to me, why would you want to write a book? There are far too many books out there already. Is it going to make a difference? Are you going to write a work that works? Um, a work that works is an alchemical notion of being a touchstone, like that people wouldn't quite be the same after they put it down than they were when they first picked it up. And and that's kind of set the mark really high for me in, in writing this book. And, and initially that other big, tomb up there, the green thing, um, is, is my PhD, which was 750 pages um, on design for human and planetary health. That, that was the first book I wrote. Um, but what I'm getting to is that in designing regenerative cultures, at the very beginning, I realized that if I was going to focus on solutions, answers, and hear the clear pathways of how to create a regenerative culture, then most likely, some, not all, but some of what I was going to put in it would five or 10 years later not be that meaningful anymore because it, the, the context changed, the world changes, and it will, will have looked, would have looked pretty flat. Yeah? Um, and in many ways, I, 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 when I was sitting with that, I realized that answers and solutions of today are most likely the causes of unforeseen consequences and problems tomorrow. That means that throughout most of history, the, the 0.5 percent of sociopaths and and, and narcissists and that, that really want to fuck things up, they are out there. But most people are out there to try to create a better world. And and whatever they did in the past, they they did it thinking that that was the right thing. They were maybe not th thinking straight, but but they they did it from that point of view. And so so for me. I believe that questions are much more powerful than answers and solutions. And that that doesn't mean that we have to just sit around and ask things and not do anything. Like creating solutions, creating answers is testing your questions, but the, the solutions and the answers are the transitory means to create better questions, rather as we as a culture are taught to believe, ask a quick question so you can get to the answer. Yeah? And the answer isn't what matters as much as the question. And, and, and I'm saying this so long-windedly in response to your question is that for me, that is the core of creating regenerative cultures. It is about living the questions together. It is about understanding that you never get there, that there is no destination sustainability. There is no destination regenerative culture or smart village. It'll be a journey. And once you set out understanding that you're walking that pilgrimage and that the walk, the, the, the path is what matters and not the destination, you do the thing differently. And that's a major shift. And, and also what comes with creating a culture that is question rather than solution and answer centric, in that minute, somebody coming with this solution and somebody coming with that solution aren't diametrically opposed enemies that need to fight it out and be right or wrong. They're just, oh, well, solutions, answers, yeah, cool. Let's look at all of them, learn from all of them. They're all kind of transient, aren't they? Are they asking, are they answering to the right question? And suddenly you can hold the complexity of multiple points of views and multiple ways of doing things in a whole different way. And I think that is the big jump that we need to do, whether it's on the planetary level to find a solution out of this mess, or on the small smaller level of human communities to, like, there's lots, lots of talk we need to design as nature of learn from nature, where people still create false dualisms between nature and culture in, in that process. 
But if we're really understanding ourselves as human beings, as expressions of this wonderful planetary process called life, then our diversity of opinions and our diversity of doing things and our diversity of worldviews is actually part of the juiciness of life, part of what creates creativity and creates um, novelty on the evolutionary journey. And, and I think that if we can, it's, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy because there's lots of people out there who are going to say, yeah, we need diverse opinions, but we don't need fucking Nazis. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it's still holding the spectrum more than othering people uh -huh. as much as there's lots of people that trigger me that I would like to other and that I probably am othering. When did you release the book? Because I, I've read through the passage um, about asking questions and about living mm -hmm. the question. And it seems so relevant in the last two years, but it seems like you've been ahead of that curve, like haven't had the chance to witness the way Western culture has been evolving in the last two years. Well, the, the, the book came out in 2016, which when you when you understand the full publishing process means that I actually pretty much stopped writing it at the beginning of um, 2015 and, um, and really wrote it mainly in, in um, 2014. And but, but it's the same, like, I, as I said, I wrote this PhD on design for human and planetary health, which came out in 2006. And people looked at me saying planetary health what's that? Yeah. Now there's a planetary health alliance with 270 universities around the world researching the connection between planetary health and human health. And now that we've had the pandemic, everybody is talking about, oh yeah, we should pay attention to how ecosystem cells and planetary health is. It's, it's like, I'm not saying how, how clever am I? I've said, said it first. I learned it from other people. This shit has been around for 50 years. Um, um, it's just slowly percolating into a wider awareness. I, I was so happy to hear you talk about asking the right questions. I've got a whole video planned with script written about asking the right questions that I've been waiting to start working on. It's such a critical thing that it's part of that reciprocal embodied knowing rather than having the answer and proceeding with like a recipe or a checklist of things and, and like forcing your idea onto other people or onto the environment. It's, uh, it just seems so much more in line with indigenous ways of knowing where there's, there's a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. that, that's the, I mean, this whole thing of how do we truly work with complexity and honestly accept multiple ways of knowing? Because what we've been so trained in, uh, I mean, you're sm smart people, I'm not completely daft. Um, we're all trained in this, somehow competitiveness of right ideas and wrong ideas and somehow the the mind and the intellect and the the analysis and and the the, the science being just the neater the cleaner the the more real um way of doing things and to really let go of not let completely go of that because that's the other pendulum swing of, of people saying we don't need the mind we don't need analysis we don't need science that that would be madness as well but how do you place something that has become so powerful and has created such powerful technologies as the ones that that are connecting us right now um and then say honestly and truly and not in a tokenist way that a shaman in whatever way they, in their cultural context, see fit, whether it's through dancing, through ritual, or even through psychotropic plants, um, coming to a deeper connection with the wider flow of life. Like if our sciences are now saying everything is connected and and maybe consciousness is primary and not matter, and um, then maybe all their so-called primitive technologies are light years ahead of AI and Watson and all that shite. Uh -huh. um, and how do you hold them next to each other without saying that you hang out in your village and somebody comes after having just smoked a big reefer and, and saying, oh, I have this intuition. I think we shouldn't call it smart village. I think we should call it um, 
Gaia, and let's just all dance around in the circle. And I'm not, I'm not wanting to be dismissive of people who call things Gaia and dance around the circle. I've done that many times myself. I worked with Gaia education for many, many years. But it's this finding the right balance between these different worldviews and really appreciating science for what it can do. But how do you put it next to the qualitative, the embodied, the sense, stuff that doesn't quite feel right? Uh, like, I trust my gut more than my brain. And it's entirely based on experience that every time I tried to overrule my gut by, with my brain, it just caused lots of problems. Uh, but most cu cultures don't work that way. Well, our Western culture doesn't. If you like this content, you might want to check out our seven ways to adapt to the future guidebook. Get it for free at futurethinkers.org slash sign up. You might also want to check out our Future Thinkers membership area. We have courses there to help you adapt to the changing world, build resilience, upgrade culture and society, and create meaning and purpose in your life. As well, you'll get access to our community, all of our unreleased content, private Zoom calls, live Q&As with guests, workshops and events, and more. Just go to members.futurethinkers.org. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and comment. It really helps out our show more than you know. And if you want more like it, then subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified of new videos. See you next time.